Thank you. Uh, yeah, so again, acknowledging that this work that I'm about to present was done on the traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Uh, great, so the title of this presentation is Identifying Patterns, Contexts, and Motivations of Pauper's Use Among Young Sexual Minority Men or Young GBMSM in Vancouver. Uh, so this is a qualitative study that I'm about to present, again, using context data, so it's um, using the same study data as a few of the other panelists. Uh, so before actually going into the study itself, I'm going to give a brief background on paupers and what they are. So paupers are used by roughly 30% of GBMSM in Canada. Uh, so those are referring to numbers uh, used in the past six months or used in the past 12 months. Uh, and for folks who don't know very much about poppers, so they, they come in little glass vials and they're essentially volatile liquid, uh, so you can inhale them and there are a number of physiological uh, results from that. They've been used by gay, uh, bisexual and other men who have sex with men for uh, many decades now, um, and they're known to facilitate anal sex and sexual pleasure. So one of the reasons for this is they relax smooth muscle in the body, and so that actually makes it easier to bottom or to have a uh, receptive anal sex. So in 2013, there was a federal crackdown on Popper's products in Canada. Prior to that point, you could go into a store and effectively buy legal Popper's. Uh, currently, since that time, there's no opportunity for legal sale in Canada. Uh, so we know that people are still using Popper's in quite high numbers. However, we don't really know what that policy change has actually, or the ways in which that policy change has influenced people. Currently, there's no real evidence on um, how that's influencing people's lives. So that brings us to this study itself. Uh, so the research question we were trying to answer was the following. What are the experiences and perspectives of young sexual minority men who use poppers in the context of a federal crackdown? Uh, so again, yeah, I'm not going to talk much about the methods, but feel free to ask me after. Uh, but this was using semi-structured interview data. Uh, and the population or the sample, uh, they were all young sexual minority men in Vancouver all of whom had at one point used drugs during sex. Uh, so there were 50 different participants who were interviewed. Uh, the average age, again, was 24. So we were definitely getting a youth perspective. 40% uh, had used poppers in the last 12 months. Uh, so just to mention that there were people who participated in the interviews that maybe had used poppers but not recently, or just knew about poppers from their experiences in the community and shared that information with us. Uh, you can't see probably the numbers very well there, but just showing again, the majority of uh, the people we interviewed were cisgendered and either identified as gay or bisexual. However, there was a diversity of other representations in terms of gender and sexual orientation. So this was a thematic analysis. Uh, so there are three themes that I'm gonna talk about today. The first being identity, the second control, and the third uncertainty. And so I'll go into each theme uh, in a bit more detail. So the first theme we noticed was identity. Uh, so people often talked about poppers in relation to their own personal identity as queer people, uh, and more generally in relation to a cultural identity uh, within the queer population. Uh, so there's this really clear link between poppers and queerness. So yeah, I'll, I'll get into that. This is a quote from Daz, who's a 27-year-old white, gay, and cis man. Uh, this is Daz's experience bringing poppers across the American border in the context of a federal crackdown. Uh, so Daz says, my friends and I have a theory that unless you get a border guard who's gay, nobody's going to know what it is. It's a substance that's used purely within the gay community. Uh, and so Daz goes on to describe you know, bringing poppers on the plane, and because they're less than 100 milliliters, no one really cared. Um, yeah, which is kind of Maybe not the best, they're quite flammable, but <laughs> another point. <laughs> um, right, and so there's clearly a, a close association between poppers and queerness to the extent that, again, as Daz says, people outside that community probably aren't even going to know what they are. But we also notice that along with that close association, poppers as a queer kind of cultural niche thing, there was a lot of stigma. Uh, so this is a quote from Brazil, who's a 19-year-old Latino and white, straight and pansexual identified cis man. And Brazil says, uh, this is his experience describing different drugs, either that he's done or that he knows about. Poppers is a super gay one. 
and fuck that, because I'm a top. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, as you can kind of probably tell from that quote, there is a stigma associated with poppers, and it's not just because they're um, a substance, it's not just because they might be perceived as a drug, but because they're associated with queerness, and specifically with bottoming. So the second theme along with identity that we noticed was this theme of control. Uh, so when people were describing their experiences with poppers, um, they noted that they increased their ability to control the body, uh, particularly during sex. Um, and these discussions of control also shed light on a lot of uh, aspects of sexual health that aren't properly addressed in heteronormative discussions of sex and in those kinds of publications. So this is a quote from Valentina. Valentina is a 29-year-old, white, uh, gay and queer identified cis man. Uh, and this is Valentina's experience using poppers to help with the bottoming process. Uh, so Valentina says, I always find, this might seem kind of stupid, I use like my yoga breathing to like help it because breathing controls muscles and that's where kind of poppers kind of skirted that whole idea where it was just like, it just did it for you. Um, you know, so clearly poppers can be used in a therapeutic sense. Uh, other participants also described using poppers uh, and actually using them to facilitate uh, sexual practices that they wouldn't otherwise have been able to do or to have sex with partners that otherwise they wouldn't have been able to. So this is again a quote from Valentina. Valentina goes on to describe that yes, poppers can be used to facilitate sex that otherwise wouldn't happen, um, but it can also be used as a form of it's a kind of form of sexual harm reduction. So they actually reduce harms um, that are otherwise associated with bottoming. So Valentina says, back when poppers were legal, I used to do them a lot just because it relaxes the muscles and prevents, not prevents, it doesn't prevent tears, you prevent tears, but it makes the tears a lot less. Tears and hemorrhoids and all those horrible things that happen because they suck. Um, yeah, so like I said, this, these are issues that are not typically discussed in relation to uh, sexual health. Uh, particularly in terms of heteronormative discussions of sexual health, but clearly poppers are seen as therapeutic uh, in reducing harms like uh, hemorrhoids and like anal tears. So the third theme that I'm going to talk about is uncertainty. Uh, poppers were discussed in relation to uncertainty in a number of different ways. Um, the first way is that uh, people were often uncertain of the actual health effects of poppers. Uh, so they were describing their own uh, knowledge of poppers related harms as quite low. Uh, and people also talked about poppers in relation to uncertainty uh, in the actual process of procuring poppers or buying poppers in this unregulated context. Uh, so this is a quote from Daz again. Um, and so this is Daz's experience going to a sexual health clinic and actually asking for information about poppers harms. He didn't feel like he knew enough. Uh, so Daz says, yeah, I guess for what I was asking for is like, is this safe for me to use? And the sexual health nurse essentially said, yes, but there's no real information about their long-term use in terms of like, is it doing anything to your brain? Or is it like doing anything to your lungs? Uh, and so yeah, Daz, like a lot of other people, you know, the self-assessed knowledge of Popper's harms is quite low. Uh, and this is concerning because despite being, you know, kind of an obscure topic in relation to the general um, literature around drugs, there has been a significant amount of work done on Popper's harms. Uh, but clearly this is uh, not information that's being widely distributed. Uh, and thinking of this in the context of a ban, this hasn't been a priority in terms of knowledge, transma knowledge translation or dissemination of that research. Uh, so this is another quote from Daz. Uh, so this is talking more about uncertainty in the actual process of buying poppers and what that looks like. So Daz says, I've purchased poppers off like, people will advertise them on, on Craigslist and on Grindr and Scruff. And so I've purchased them through that means, which kind of, it's a bit uncomfortable for me because it kind of feels like a bit drug dealerish. And um, you're meeting someone random and having money for this like little bottle. Uh, and so very clearly, right, Daz is describing this parallel between uh, buying illicit poppers and buying other forms of illicit drugs. Uh, and there's, you know, a number of problems here. Uh, one of them, of course, Daz describes as, as being quite uncomfortable. Um, and especially framing the conversation before we see poppers are known to have therapeutic benefits for queer men. Um, and since the ban uh, has essentially made them illegal to, uh, to sell, uh, there's this process of marginalization. So now people are having to go to underground markets, uh, and clearly this is an uncomfortable experience for them. 
Uh, another harm or another problem that I see here is that um, you know, Daz is meeting someone, as he describes, someone random uh, from online, from Craigslist or Grindr. Um, so Daz isn't going to know a lot about that person. Um, Daz probably isn't going to know if they're a safe person to meet. And they also don't know anything about the bottle of poppers that they're about to buy uh, in terms of what's in that bottle. Uh, is it safe for me to use? Uh, so that brings us to the point that not all poppers are actually made the same. Poppers refer to a family of different chemicals, uh, and some of them are more harmful than others. Uh, so these are just some uh, papers that refer to poppers' maculopathy. So this is one of the more serious harms associated with poppers' use, and it's a form of central vision blindness. Uh, and it's disproportionately associated with isopropyl nitrate, which is a specific for uh, form of poppers' chemical. Uh, and thinking about uncertainty in the process of buying poppers, um, you know, given the current policy, there's no way to know what chemical you're buying, and so you could be putting yourself at much higher risk for poppers maculopathy uh, without having any real way to navigate that. Uh, so just a summary of what we found from the study. Uh, so firstly, we know poppers continue to be a part of queer personal and cultural identities. Uh, this is significant because this was a youth study. Uh, and so normally when we think about poppers, or at least I'm used to think about this way, they're very closely associated with sexual culture in the 80s. Um, but we know that they still do feature in uh, younger queer folks' ideas of their own, their own culture and ideas of queerness. Uh, the study also affirmed that poppers may be used in therapeutic ways. Uh, so they can both uh, facilitate sex that otherwise might not happen or might be difficult and uncomfortable and they can potentially reduce harms, uh, including those associated with anal tears and hemorrhoids. Um, one general conclusion is that we know the current policy systematically harms gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex, men, who have sex with men. Uh, one of the ways this happens is that, of course, there's a restriction of access to products that we know are therapeutic and that we actually knew were therapeutic before the ban happened. Um, and the policy also harms GBMSM by creating uncertainty, again, in the procurement of safe poppers. Um, so potentially exposing people to marginalizing and unsafe situations buying poppers, uh, and also you know, creating a lot of uncertainty in the products themselves. So looking to the future, uh, in writing up these, re or these findings, I should say, we call on the federal government to revisit current policy on poppers. Um, I should note there's, you know, there is precedent for this, so recently um, there have been examples of governments choosing either not to regulate poppers as an illegal drug or choosing to regulate poppers in a way that they can be accessed through a pharmacy or accessed through other kind of, um, you know, other uh, appropriate ways. Um, we also recommend that GBMSM should of course be meaningfully involved in this policy change as it's addressed. Uh, and the last point, so uh, the current policy is, of course, a prohibition, like a prohibitory policy that's focusing on you know, restricting all access. Uh, we instead recommend health promotion activities uh, to be considered, so specifically health promotion activities that represent uh, both the unique sexual experiences of GBMSM, so recognizing that queer sex looks different than other forms of sex, and so there are specific um, issues like anal tears, hemorrhoids, um, sexual compatibility that poppers may address. Um, and also recognizing that uh, you know, there's a real impact of safe drugs apply on effective harm reduction. Uh, and so when there isn't any form of regulated market, it's a lot harder as an individual who uses poppers to engage in harm reduction. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to uh, say a brief thanks to Rod, who uh, co-authored this paper and was yeah, led, leading the study into all the, the context study team. So yeah, thanks, and participants who are involved.